go. So I'm just say welcome again now that we are recording and hand it over to Angela Tripp. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, this, in case you're in the wrong in the wrong room, this is a remote usability testing webinar. Um, it's brought to you by a pretty awesome team um, of LSN TAP, Michigan Advocacy Program, and the Graphic Advocacy Project. It's kind of a culmination of uh, the usability um, training TIG that the Michigan Advocacy Program um, has been working on over the last few years. Hopefully some of you have participated in other aspects of that. And so this is, um, instead of our, our, our Testapalooza at ITC, uh, we're offering this webinar. So. Um, we are really lucky to be joined by several uh, panelists. Um, we have uh, LaDeirdre Johnson, um, the manager of LSNTAP. Can you go to the next slide? Um, Ashley Trenny and Victoria Sewardeman, uh, both from Graphic Advocacy Project, and they're going to do the bulk of the presentation. Um, but we also are very fortunate to have um, some additional panelists to talk about their experiences with remote usability testing. Um, uh, Carla from Ileo, Illinois Legal Aid Online, Lauren from Lone Star Legal Aid, and Kim from Michigan Legal Help. And they are going to do their own introductions uh, when it's their turn. So now I'm going to pass it off to Ashley. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, it's great to be here today. Um, we're very excited um, about this presentation. Um, so just um, for a little bit of orientation, um, the, the presentation today is really gonna focus on um, you know, these, these four sections. So we'll talk um, a little bit about just the broader user research landscape and opportunities that there are to conduct um, user research. We're gonna focus in the majority of the presentation on talking about usability testing and why we do it, as well as preparing for and conducting that usability testing. And then we have some exciting resources to share at the end. Um, so first and foremost, what is user research? So user research is an important tool that really allows us to understand and assess how our resources are really serving our clients and our users. Um, it seeks to you know, understand user behaviors, their pain points, their needs, and their motivations for seeking out information for engaging with a service um, and really allows us to, you know, to understand and empathize from the perspective um, of our clients, um, sort of what they need. Um, so user research is really helpful. There's a variety of ways to, to sort of conduct research through different methods, depending on, on your goals. And we'll talk more about that today. Um, and it really helps to expose the root cause of problems and opportunities for improvement. Um, so at the end of the day, really putting people at the center of the design process is our best chance for getting adoption, making an impact and achieving success. I'm gonna turn it over to Ladirja to really talk about why this is so important for, for us in this space. Thank you, Ashley. So I think it was really important that we put this slide um, kind of at the outset of this presentation, um, because there is a lot of talks about usability testing and who's doing it and how are we doing it and all of that is important. But we want to talk about not only why usability testing in particular is important, but overall, why is it important to involve our users and Regardless of what kind of projects you're doing, ultimately you're designing it for your users. And thus the users should really be um, at the center and your project should reflect the needs of our users. Oftentimes we are all very smart and we have great ideas of what, how we can better assist our users and what they need. But sometimes, unfortunately, we're wrong, completely wrong. And it's important to understand that the way that our brains, especially, you know, legally trained brains think about problems are often very different from our users. And so it's really important to hear their voices and hear um, actually what they need. The best way to understand the needs of the users is simply to talk to them and get them involved at the beginning. Uh, most of the time, usability testing is it's not usually at the end, you can get it as soon as you have a, you know, viable product, but it's really important to, excuse me, get users involved in the research uh, 
portion as well, right at the outset to understand um, what do they actually need and creating these tools that are centered around your users, um, not only fulfill those basic needs, but it does build both trust and retention because your users will trust that while we were involved, trust your tools that you're making and also um, continue to use, you know, different iterations or more tools that you use and um, refer other people to them. And as uh, Angela usually says in her presentations, she has this little graphic and I always come back to it because it has just resonated with me. We don't want to build rocket ships when our users just need a bike ramp, so. Um, thank you so much. Um, so yeah, so like Lydia mentioned, um, involving users at you know every stage of the process is is really critical to build that trust and to ensure that you're getting that user perspective. Um, you're getting those insights about the things that they really need at at various stages of the process. Um, so when we talk about this process, oftentimes you know we're thinking of it in the context of you know the design process, and there's a really great. Um, framework here in this visualization. This is called the double diamond. Um, it's a common framework for talking about design process um, that I think does a really good job of showing the iterative nature of research and design. So at a very high level, you'll see that this diagram um, right has a lot of arrows pointing back to each other. It's a you know a lot of opportunity to have research and form insights which directly inform our solutions and that process never stops we can continuously be learning and we can continuously be improving um, our resources so that they you know best support um, your end users and um, like Ladirja mentioned there's different opportunities throughout this process you know at the very beginning at the onset of a new project as well as iterating on existing resources. Um, and so we'll spend a lot of time focusing on that today. Um, so kind of to level set, look, you know, zoom out a little bit, take a look at, at the landscape. There are a lot of different types of research that you can conduct. And what that really maps back to is, is understanding your goals, maybe where you are in this design process, whether you are, you know, desiring more exploratory research to really explore a problem space or you know, confirm um, or validate assumptions that you might have. Um, maybe you are in the process of you know, thinking about solutions and you want to really use research to generate more hypotheses or you know, create focus areas or ideate specific solutions about a problem that you've identified. Or perhaps you want to leverage research to evaluate existing ideas, to really validate those solutions um, and, and iterate on, on a current understanding of a particular problem. So there are a lot of different types of research that can serve um, different phases of, of the, the sort of broader process that we just shared. And so it's really important going into any project to have that clarity around, you know, are we, are we doing exploratory research, generative research, or evaluative research? Um, within those different types of research, there's also a lot of different types of methods. Um, and so this, um, a matrix like this um, can be really helpful at understanding how different methods that you might choose to conduct research can have um, different outcomes, right? Can reveal different learnings um, about things that you might be trying to understand. Um, and so this is a great matrix um, that really highlights um, these two main quadrants. So um, behavioral versus attitudinal. Um, and so this is behavioral being, you know, your, an understanding of your user's current process or actions or things that they might be taking versus more attitudinal, which is maybe, you know, understanding their mental models or their thought processes or reactions to an existing space. Um, and then the, the next quadrant is maybe more familiar um, to us all, but, you know, the difference between qualitative uh, insights and quantitative insights. So qualitative maybe being more about, you know, feedback and opportunity space sentiment um, where quantitative, uh, maybe, you know, being more focused on um, quantitative data, things that can be more, more measured. Um, so, you know, once we really understand the goals of the research, we can really focus in on choosing the best methods that allow us to achieve those learnings. And specifically today, you know, we are talking about, you know, remote usability testing. 
Um, we also wanted to highlight that in general, there are you know, a lot of research, um, research, research methods that do lend themselves well to remote research. And so there's a couple highlighted here. Um, today, we're gonna really hone in on one specific method, usability testing, um, and how and where it fits into this broader design process and the things that we can really learn and leverage from bringing this into to our work. Um, and so to dive into that, I'm gonna turn it over to Victoria. Thanks, Ashley. Um, so as Ashley mentioned, the focus of our session today is on usability testing, specifically remote usability testing, but just um, an overview of what usability testing is. I like to use this infographic because it really distinguishes the differences between more broad um, conversational interviewing usability me or um, research methods and usability testing, which is um, really a method that observes how a participant would interact with a thing. I usually call it a thing because it can be anything, an experience, a paper, a website. Um, today we'll end up calling it a prototype, but we'll get to that. And just to highlight here that the main goal of usability testing is really to identify usability issues. Next slide, please. So again, what is usability testing? As I mentioned in the previous slide, it's a research method used to evaluate a thing, kind of usually falls in that evaluate bucket that Ashley went over. Um, and it's important to note that it, it is an observation of um, a thing. So you have something tangible that a research participant is going to interact with and evaluate and review with you. Because of this, um, questions and prompts are often task-based. Um, this is really to um, prompt your participant to interact with the thing. So you're wanting to see, you know, how they go through your design or your website or whatever your thing is. Um, because of uh, this is, you know, you're watching them interact. It's also falls on that behavioral spectrum that Ashley went over in that matrix. Um, you are actually observing how they interact with the thing, um, not just asking their thoughts or, you know, asking more broad questions. It is important to know to have it kind of buried um, in that behavioral bullet is that usability testing is simulating an environment. So while we are watching them observe or observing them, you know, interact with your thing, um, and hopefully that can give us some clues about how they would interact with it in real life. It is a simulated environment and um, artificial scenario. There are some factors that you just can't recreate, like how someone might be filling out a form in real life, what, where they are in that, you know, that space and that emo the emotion they're feeling. Um, that might not be able to, to be something that we can see and observe, but at the very least, we can watch, um, you know, their actions as they're walking through and, and prompt them along the way. So again, this method really helps us see where there are issues with the thing, but it also might uncover how users think about what they're doing. So um, one really interesting thing is through usability testing, um, you might, you know, have a specific design set up and you're wanting to see how they interact, but through this testing, you, it can reveal that they they actually think about things completely different. There's a different sequence of actions. They have different expectations of your thing. Um, so uh, that can again unco be uncovered in usability testing. Um, and one thing that we've just noted is that it shouldn't all it shouldn't be the only method that you're using. Um, is a really accessible method, and we of course. Um, you know, want you to do it, but kind of back to what Lodirder said, it's important to incorporate your users throughout your process and get them involved as much as you can. So hopefully that this method is just another way to continue to build your knowledge and understanding of your user. So where does this fall in the double diamond that um, Ashley presented just a bit ago? It actually can come in at any stage of the process. So it could be done early on, to identify um, existing issues or problems for informing solutions so sort of early on in the double diamond. It could be done once a solution has been proposed. So you're wanting to actually validate based on your research, does this actually meet what users are needing? It could be done after a solution has been validated. So at that point, you might just be iterating and hoping to find um, issues to fix to make it really the best solution that there is. Uh, so it really, we put it right there in the middle because it's part of the iterative process. It can come in at any of the stages. All right, diving even in even deeper about what are some goals for usability testing. As I mentioned, primarily it is used to determine usability issues, but there are a couple different flavors of it. When it's used in a more formative manner, <laughs> you're observing how participants are interacting and you're actually you know, thinking about um, specific ways to fix them and soliciting ideas for um, how to fix those issues. So you might have some specific design questions 
does this button go over here? Does it go over there? Um, and asking questions about how users might use a thing or have used something in the past. When it's used in a more summative benchmarking manner, it's, it's, it's I think actually called usability benchmarking, but um, you might have a more polished solution. You might have your existing resource and you're interested in measuring performance. So how many people are actually accomplishing what they need to do with your thing at this time? And then maybe when you propose a new solution, you wanna test that and see that it's actually performing better. So there are some, um, some ways to use usability testing to measure performance. And especially when you have multiple concepts, so whether this is like a redesign happening or you have multiple designs that you're testing out, um, you can do that in usability testing as well. It's not limited to just one version. One important thing to note during um, testing multiple concepts is that um, order bias is the thing that happens. Whatever one might do first or see first might bias them in how they interact with um, everything following. So making sure you alternate the order of um, those concepts. All right, so lastly, um, everything I just covered, I know we're focused on remote usability testing today, but everything I just mentioned really is true of usability testing in general, um, both remote and in-person, you know, it's an observation method, you're looking at behavior, it can meet different goals for you. Um, the rest of this presentation will focus specifically on remote usability testing, but I do wanna highlight a couple of the differences between remote and in-person. Um, first is that it's actually not so different. So one of the things um, that, you know, Ashley showed in the matrix is, and highlighted is that um, many of the methods that you can do in person and that are commonly done in person can be done remotely, especially today with all of the technology um, that we have possible. There are different considerations though, when you're doing things remotely, it does require a little bit more prep and a little bit more setup. Um, and you have to be more creative in the tools that you're using to capture observations because typically if you're in person, you're just sitting next to them, you might just see things um, remotely. You'll have to you know, think about, uh, just be more intentional about how you're actually capturing those observations. And then lastly, remote usability testing actually has its own benefits. One, you might be able to reach users you might not normally be able to reach, just a wider audience. You know, If you're only able to do in your own geographical area, in this way, you might reach more people. Um, you can collect large amounts of data. Again, with technology, you, know, you can reach more people. And there is also, um, you have some interviewer bias when you're doing in-person work with folks. So in this remote setting, you might be able to remove some of that pressure and people might be more honest with you in their feedback um, on your thing. So that is a little overview on usability testing. Next, we're actually gonna talk about some of the logistics of what it means to do a usability test, starting with preparing. So in preparing for a usability test, it's really similar to any other research effort. You're scoping your project and thinking about what you're wanting to learn, creating a research plan and guide plan of questions, um, preparing the thing you're wanting to test. Again, we're calling it a prototype, so whatever materials and tools you'll need for that. And then lastly, of course, actually recruiting your uh, participants. So we'll start with project scoping and I'll pass it back to Ashley. Awesome, thank you. Um, so yeah, project scoping is, is very critical at the start of any project or research phase. Um, you know, it's just important to have that plan of action for you and your team to hone in on the specific goals and learning objectives that, you know, you are intending to learn. Um, and also, you know, just creates that alignment right across your team around what those goals and objectives are. Um, it's also a very valuable thing to be able to point back to and refer back to as you move through through the process um, to keep to keep those goals front of mind. Um, so creating a project brief or a project plan is a great place to start. Um, obviously, you know, you can't test everything. So this it also really helps to, to think meaningfully about, you know, what can be tested, what feels like too much, what feels like not enough. Um, so it's really important to start, you know, thinking about the scope of that project and really defining that from the onset. Um, as a result of, you know, creating that project scope or that project plan, um, it allows you to think, you know, about some of those aspects that will start to, um, you know, unfold as you continue in the planning process. So as you hone in on, you know, the learning objectives, the things that you intend to learn, that will help really define 
um, you know, the methods that you're using, right? Reiterating why usability testing, you know, is the best sort of research method um, for this particular project. Um, and we'll also start to give insights into different ways that you might prototype or, you know, set up that usability test based on your learning objectives and, um, you know, the audiences that you're intending to connect with. A project brief um, has a few sort of core elements to it. Um, again, you know, to create that alignment across the team to really think through that project plan. Um, so the project brief often consists of your problem statement, right? The piece that you're really, you know, want to focus on, the thing that you, that, um, you want to explore, um, the target audience that you want to connect with through this opportunity. Um, any identified constraints, right? So right off the bat, understanding that, you know, remote research will be conducted, um, you know, identifying that as a constraint that will help um, with your planning moving forward. This is also a great place to list out any hypotheses you may have, right? To get those down, to identify those as assumptions and be able to return to those later on after you've conducted research. Um, it's a great place to start thinking through some of those activities and timeline. And so, you know, all these things here, again, to really help to scope and shape, um, you know, that plan and make sure that, that you and your team are aligned. Um, Victoria, I'll pass it back to you. Yes, thank you. So once you have scoped your project and determined who it is that you're interested in talking to and some of your activities and determining that Usability testing is one of those activities. Um, it's helpful to create a guide and a guide can be for really any method that you're choosing, but for usability testing specifically, it's really helpful to get down all of the questions you're wanting to ask and then also sequencing and organizing your questions, especially this is considering that a participant is gonna be walking through interacting with something. So it's important to kind of set up the scenarios and um, have the questions in the right order. So. Some of the primary elements of a testing guide um, is one, just having an introduction. So you're explaining some goals, setting some ground expectations, um, walking the participant into what they're gonna do for the session, um, begin with some background questions, and then ask questions in reference to the thing you're reviewing, the prototype. So this is again, setting up a scenario for context, getting them in the right mindset um, as they start walking through it, and then closing out with some wrap up questions and always allowing some space for additional comments. Um, have some these next few slides are going to be uh, examples in like sample language that you can use kind of um, in these different sections of a usability testing guide. So first on an introduction, um, important to orient the participant to your goals. This is just broadly. Um, so, you know, they just know what you're interested, what, what you're working on and what this session is all about. It is important to maybe not tell them too much because you might bias them in how they will answer your questions based on what they think you're looking for um, um, or otherwise. So again, just, just hitting the right level of what are your goals, but not telling them just too much um, in leading them. Always giving them a disclaimer of what they'll be doing and reviewing, especially on um, if you have an unpolished product or prototype that you're walking through, um, just letting them know that that's the case so that they're not like, this sucks, there's no color. <laughs> well, that's because this is a very early stage prototype and idea um, and not to expect a fully developed product. And then always um, set the expectation just generally when they're answering questions in a research setting for you that um, they're really in control. They can stop whenever they'd like to stop. They can skip questions when they need to skip. Um, yeah, so just that they are in control of this session. Obviously, there are specific questions we're hoping that they'll answer, but uh, that it's it's up to them, you know, how they participate. The second um, slide is around background questions. Again, just really sample language, but uh, it helps ease participants into answering questions and um, can also really give you some important context around their current experience, what they've done in the past, and how that sort of colors the way that they answer questions and interact with your prototype moving forward. Um, again, so this is the bulk of uh, usability testing is around more task-based um, questions. And it could be different depending on what you're interested in learning. Um, but if you're interested in learning about navigation, you might ask them like, what are you gonna do next? And you can see where they you know, click and go. If you're interested in functionality, helping asking some probing questions around um, how they might use something. And then important to ask about comprehension and mental model. Again, is, is this what you thought it would do? Is this what you were looking for? 
Um, so it, it kind of varies there. It, I would say also um, ask other questions in between these questions, because these are very like logistical. You're asking them to walk through something, but in between ask them why to, you know, like talk me through how you would use this information. Why is that the way you would use it? So always find um, opportunities to both get the observation, see how they would complete things using your thing, but also um, hoping to understand the why behind it as well. Kind of to the more um, summative, like benchmarking types of usability testing, there are some performance-based questions that you can ask that this, it's very like um, measurable. So uh, asking some questions around test time, um, success failure, number of errors, these are just some sample language you can kind of probe and um, watch folks do. But in these types of questions is really critical to um, observe because uh, if you are doing more of a measuring type of usability testing, they might not talk as much as opposed to when you were probing about um, issues and questions. If you are just you know, having them actually do something and watching them, observation is critical because they might um, they might not talk out loud about why they've uh, done something, but you know, just note it down as that's something that you've noticed. Uh, preference questions is again to the kind of the flavor of usability testing that is multiple. So if you have different versions, um, when you are showing multiple versions, don't forget to ask about preference. So if you do one and then the other, you know, asking about those um, preferences and why. Also, might be nice to allow. Um, participants to react to different elements of each version. So if you're showing two different versions, maybe they like some parts of one and some parts of two um, and having them comment on that. And then lastly, uh, that fourth element, just wrapping up questions. Um, it's, it's nice to have participants reflect on what they did and reviewed. Some rating questions are a helpful way to capture a more quantitative measure, especially if you're able to cap talk to a bunch of participants, you can kind of average it out, see how people are finding usability, usefulness, um, and then always allowing space for any additional suggestions, ideas, or just overall thoughts on what they share, uh, reviewed that day. So I talked a bunch about prototypes. I'm gonna hand off to Ashley to talk even more. Awesome, thank you. Um... Yes, yeah, so um, continuing on with the, the planning and the project scoping, um, you know, after you're creating the usability testing guides and thinking about the questions um, and the sort of the script that um, you'll be guiding uh, your research participant through, um, you know, this is the opportunity to really think about what is that thing that they will be interacting with, right? What are you testing with? Um, and so part of that also maps back to, you know, the, the goals, right, the research goals and the learning objectives, the things that you're really focusing on for this usability test. And you may be, you know, focusing in on different things, you might be really interested in getting feedback on content, um, maybe navigation and information architecture, right, um, the, the hierarchy of certain information. Um, the layout of a page, right, how, how folks are, you know, finding and discovering certain information. Um, or potentially, you know, functionality on the site as a whole. Um, so, you know, these different things can help to inform, um, you know, how you might prototype this solution that you will then offer to the participant to test with. Um, another thing, you know, thinking through um, determining what kind of prototype you'll make is, you know, who, who you're intending to test with. This might, you know, the, the audience that you're trying to connect with and do research with, there might be considerations here that determine you know, a certain prototyping tool or framework over another. Um, so it's always really interesting to think about that. Um, assistive technologies, non-native English speakers, you know, potentially testing on a, in a mobile first environment as opposed to um, desktop. Um, and so thinking through all of these considerations up front is a really great way to, you know, get to the right type of prototype that supports your learning objectives, that supports um, the usability script that, that you've crafted and, and to ensure that you're getting the information and gathering the information that, you know, you've set out to collect. Um, when planning prototypes for remote usability testing, um, I'm just going to highlight, uh, you know, a few ways to approach creating these resources. Um, so a few different flavors of prototypes, if you will. Um, so the first, um, just like Victoria mentioned, um, you know, maybe more in this um, usability benchmarking or summative sort of usability testing, you know, leveraging existing resources. So if you are, 
you know, interested in gathering information about a resource that, um, you know, folks are already using, um, you know, testing with, with that resource directly, again, with that focus um, and that project scope. Um, this can be really uh, beneficial for, for identifying some usability issues that might, you know, be, be at play with your current resource um, or uncovering other pain points or challenges that, you know, your users have when, when navigating a resource. Um, and so this is a really great way to, um, you know, to gather um, that initial information. Um, physical prototypes or paper prototypes are another great way, not only for testing, but for, you know, preparing for um, and creating a prototype. So, you know, this is especially if you're planning to test with a new concept or idea. Um, paper prototypes are a great way to think through that activity. Um, obviously, you know, you can, um, I think, you know, conducting a usability test with something like a paper prototype would be easier in person. Um, although there are really interesting tools um, that can, you know, be leveraged for a remote uh, capacity. So this one that I uh, put on the slide here, um, Marvel has an app called Pop, prototyping on paper, where you can actually, you know, hand sketch your wireframes on paper, take a picture of it, and create um, uh, create a prototype um, using your hand drawn sketches. Um, so another way, you know, to consider if you know, again, for that sort of new idea, you're thinking through, um, you know, putting together some solutions in those um, early stages can be a great way to think through solutions. Um, and to support the planning of, you know, the usability script that Victoria just went through. Um, it can also be really helpful to create these physical prototypes and actually, you know, feel what it's like to go through them, feel what it's like to go through that activity and test that out. And even, you know, before you begin usability testing with your participants, have a way to, you know, reflect on that and, and, and iterate on the usability test itself to really ensure that you're focusing on, you know, those specific task-based or, you um, uh, you know, research goals that you have for the usability test. Um, digital prototypes are, um, you know, another way to, um, to gather this information. And of course, one that, you know, lends itself very well to remote testing. Um, there are a lot of different tools for creating wireframes and um, interactive prototypes to sketch out your solution. Um, and these are all really good to do, um, you know, while you're fleshing out your designs. Um, wireframes, so wireframes, if you look at the top image, the sort of black and white, um, you know, mockups, right? Um, that's what we call a wireframe. And a wireframe specifically doesn't flesh out the full design. It's really focused on um, positioning the pieces of content and information as they're laid out on the page. And that's to ensure that your focus, um, your focus and energy is really on thinking about the flow of information, the content, right? from the perspective of your user, where might they think to go and find, you know, a particular piece of information or, um, you know, navigate to something that, that might be part of that task. And so it really puts the emphasis on making sure the information is designed intuitively um, rather than, you know, investing that time on, you know, fleshing out a perfectly polished design. Um, and for usability testing, where we're trying to, you know, gather information about these usability issues, um, it can be really great to, um, to show some of these earlier um, prototypes to get that information early and often so you can iterate on the design before, you know, finalizing um, the final product. Um, so um, wireframes and, and uh, programs like Balsamic are really great for, again, sort of, um, you know, creating those, um, those digital wireframes. And then there are a lot of interesting programs like InVision, where you can actually take those screens and create a simulation of a live site. So it's not you know, a live coded site, but you can through what's called um, hotspots, actually link a series of screens to give the feeling that you know, a user is interacting with something that's dynamic and that responds to the tasks that they might be engaging with. Um, we'll show some, some other tools like this later on. And, um, uh, I think we'll be hearing from, from some of the folks in our community panel about other um, free tools that they've leveraged also to simulate uh, digital prototypes. And finally, um, last but not least, um, functional prototypes. So this is actually, you know, if, if the opportunity exists, um, you know, to actually just create something that's live, um, you know, either 
for example, if you, you know, leverage WordPress or another CMS and, and you're able to sort of create a page to test with, um, or if you have engineering capacity to stand up a simple page, something where users can, you know, interact directly with the experience. Um, this is especially good for testing accessibility um, and making sure, um, you know, if you are interested in testing with folks who might need assistive technology, um, that this is, you know, a great way that they can test, um, usability test um, with, with your prototypes. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna turn, um, I'm gonna turn it over to um, some folks from our community um, to share a little bit about some of the prototypes that they've created. Um, so I will hand it over to Kim to kick us off. Um, so one tool that we used a lot in our most recent usability testing is PowerPoint. Um, and so I just wanted to highlight that as a resource that most of you probably already have access to and have decent familiarity with how to use. Um, and we don't use the actual slides from PowerPoint to show people, but PowerPoint is just a really easy place to dump a screenshot or an image. Um, oh, Lajidra is reminding me to introduce myself. <laughs> um, my name is Kim Kramer and I'm a staff attorney at the Michigan Legal Help Program. Um, and we maintain the website michiganlegalhelp.org, which is um, serves self-represented litigants in Michigan. Um, and along with one other staff attorney, I head up our usability testing at Michigan Legal Help. Um, so with that out of the way, we use PowerPoint um, because it's an easy way to just add colored shapes. You can even use, for example, if you have a screenshot from your website, you can use the little dropper tool so that something has the same color as existing elements from your website. Um, and we've found that to be a really easy way to test out, you know, what would it look like if I added a button here? Do people know what this button would do? You can just mock it up and um, throw it on your sandbox for people to take a look at. And it doesn't take our developers time to actually put it on a dev site. Um, I can just do it in PowerPoint. Um, I think Canva would be similar. So um, screenshots plus shapes in PowerPoint or Canva can go a long way. Thank you, Kim. Um, Carla? Hi everyone, I'm Carla Baldwin and I'm the product support manager at Illinois Legal Aid Online. And um, some of my jobs there are conducting usability studies and um, performing quality assurance testing on um, many of our products. So um, as far as prototyping, um, we have also used uh, PowerPoint for prototyping simple, short uh, projects that we have, things where we don't have a lot of screens. But another thing we've used is Axure, um, which uh, is an interactive prototype. And um, it's developer approved. Our developers use it, but it's also easy enough uh, for me to create prototypes. You don't have to be a programmer to use it. Um, and it, one of the reasons we like it is that it can really closely um, mimic our website. I'm sorry, that's A-X-U-R-E, Axure, yeah. Um, we can get it to closely mimic the look of our website. Um, with the prototype. And it's also really good when you're testing a long series of steps in a process, um, a little bit uh, better than it would in uh, PowerPoint, just because it is uh, so interactive. So yeah, we really like uh, Axure. Um, and uh, in my opinion, it's a lot easier to use than Figma, which is another uh, another program that we looked into. We, we like Axure. So. Awesome. Thank you, Carla. Thank you, Kim. Okay, so the final component of preparing for our usability study is, of course, recruitment. You can't do the usability study with no participants. Um, so a couple different approaches to doing recruitment. I know this is especially hot topic, especially thinking in a remote setting and also in the world that we live in today. 
Um, but first, just existing context, especially for existing resources, if you're evaluating something that you currently have or thinking about redesigning or building on what you um, already have in play, consider reaching out to those who have engaged with um, your resource before. Uh, if you don't have a contact list already, I would highly recommend consider building one. This can be as simple as tacking on a question to any resource that um, clients or folks are um, interacting with and asking if they're interested in providing feedback just so you can start building those relationships and building up that database of folks you can reach out to in these times when you want to do some testing. Um, there are, of course, other different outreach methods that you can employ in reaching out to um, existing users, email blasts, forums, um, maybe if you're feeling it, cold calling, <laughs> yeah, if you have their numbers and then uh, other places to post announcements on your website, in your office, um, thinking about um, other ways that you can get contact information. A second approach is um, outsourcing your recruiting to um, someone else. So there are some recruiting firms and platforms out there that you can outsource and actually do recruiting for you. Obviously, this is there's a cost to it. Um, because you're not doing it yourself. Uh, it does also mean you need to be really specific with your criteria. So thinking back to your project brief and also the questions that you're asking and your prototype, all of those things play into who is it that you are exactly trying to speak with um, and do testing with. So being very specific with your criteria if you're planning to outsource it. Um, some of these firms and platforms are really nice because they will handle scheduling and incentives for you. It might sound like a minor thing, but it's actually a really big deal um, when you're a busy human and you want to um, make sure you know you you are focused and have the attention to do the usability testing. Um, but there, you know, everyone has things going on, so scheduling, and we'll talk about incentives in just a minute. There is a risk to, um, especially for platforms, not so much on recruiting firms, but some of these platforms that I have listed as examples here, respondent and user interviews, they're really great, tons of users on them, um, but a risk there is you might get more tech savvy folks um, and some might be power testers, like they're on the platforms, they're doing a ton of these types of usability tests um, and other research methods. So um, that's just you know a consideration for who you might get. Another um, approach to recruiting is kind of similar to the one just, um, I just talked about before, but there are some full, like full blown uh, platforms for doing user research in general. Um, so I have a couple of these listed here, usertesting.com, uh, ping pong. And in addition to um, having user research like tools built in questions and capabilities, they also have a recruiting service often. Um, and very similar to the recruiting platforms and services, um, you'll need to be really specific with your criteria because you are outsourcing it. Um, they are quite a bit you know, expensive usually to get this, this full you know, service platform. Um, but with them, they come with some really built in, nice built-in features and questions that can help facilitate your um, remote research. Uh, and it has the same risk of who are you actually reaching out to with these platforms, um, tech savvy folks, maybe folks who are really familiar. So really regardless of the approach, those are just a couple um, couple methods there, but uh, regardless of the approach that you take to recruitment, uh, we highly recommend doing some, some screening of your participants. So um, this can help, you know, again, ensure that people are meeting your criteria, you're not wasting anyone's time and also ensures quality research um, so that someone's, you know, not just making it up, they actually know what they're talking about and can give you valuable feedback couple of tips for writing screener questions. Um, keep the questions really short. This is not the interview part of it. This is not the test part of it. This is just making sure that um, there's someone to talk to in your usability test. Uh, depending on where it comes in your process, um, if you're able to talk with them and, and validate that you know they meet all the criteria, try to get them signed up and scheduled. Uh, and then this little um, example I have on the left here are just ways to actually write questions or ask the questions. Um, you wanna be specific, but not lead, because often if you ask like, have you ever done this? Um, if someone's really interested in talking with you, they'll say yes, even if the answer is no. And then I mentioned before that scheduling, um, while seems minor, is a big deal. Uh, if you use one of those recruiting firms, platforms, or um, like user research tools, 
it will facilitate all of the scheduling for you. But if you are doing it on your own, um, it's helpful to use a tool to do the scheduling. So something like Calendly um, is something we often use. It helps organize um, time slots. So participants who are interested can pick their own time slots. Um, you set up what works for best for you. So there's no back and forth in scheduling. Um, it can also ensure participation. Some of these platforms have built-in reminders um, to make sure that folks show up. And uh, a couple tips of doing scheduling, just generally, um, depending on your target audience, remember people work just as you do. So if there are times that you can do um, usability testing outside of normal working hours, uh, and then especially in a remote setting, adding really clear instructions. So you'll be joining a Zoom, you'll be talking to me. If you can't do that, call me or email me at this number. So really clear instructions. Uh, and then lastly, incentives. Um, this is really helpful uh, and nice to just thank participants for their time. It also helps with participation. Uh, a huge issue is just getting someone to be interested in, in spending you know, a little bit of time with you to do usability testing. So um, incentives can really help encourage that participation uh, if they know that they might get a little something from it. There are a couple tips that here is um, I've worked in like state, uh, like with state agencies. So sometimes it's not appropriate to provide like monetary gifts. So just ch double check your policies, whatever it is that you can, you need to um, ensure that you're, you know, okay to do some incentives. Um, consider raffles if you're doing like some really short, you just need 10 minutes on a survey. Um, you need, you know, a couple different usability tests back to back, consider doing a raffle um, for folks time. And then if you are providing something like a gift card, making sure those are flexible um, so that participants can use them in the way that they need to. Okay, um, last note here on sample size, we'll talk a lot more about this in just a second. Um, that even within remote usability testing, there are different ways that it can be done, unmoderated or moderated. Um, if you're going the unmoderated route, you won't have to be there. Hopefully you're able to get um, even more participants. So usually if you're able to get a lot of participants, it might be nice to run some numbers, get some quantitative data there. So um, the recommendation is often to get really high numbers so that you can run statistical significance analysis, 40 plus here. For moderated, again, since you are, not maybe not you, but a facilitator is there moderating the session, it'd be really hard to talk to 40 plus people. Um, so the goal is often to talk to um, about five as industry standard, but I, I always say that should increase with the more um, like participant criteria you have, as well as uh, how often you've talked to your user base. So if you need to, if you have really limited base knowledge and you want to learn more, the more people you can talk to, the better. All right, so back to our community panel. I would love to hear some recruitment stories. I know there are tons. So Lauren, how about you kick us off? Sure, uh, my name is Lauren Figaro. I work for Lone Star Legal Aid in Houston, Texas, and I am a staff attorney and content developer. Um, my recruitment story has to do with um, our self-help tool we built for um, a website called Texas Disaster Legal Help. Uh, so it's basically a self-help tool that it's a guided interview type tool that allows people to uh, find information that is tailored to their unique um, disaster related legal, legal need. Um, so we were tasked with, you know, testing the site and um, uh, basically we had a really hard time for a couple of months getting, getting people to join. We learned a lot of lessons from that. So the first thing uh, we learned is that, um, you know, if you're doing online testing, it's really, it's a really good idea to do online recruitment. We tried to work with our legal part, with our partners in the community to gather people, but it was just not during COVID, they weren't really meeting with people at face to face either. So it was hard to go that way. Um, we actually settled on a method that actually worked out really well for us in the end was using Facebook. Um, it's very cheap to get an ad on Facebook. Uh, the ad's very effective. It's really good at um, recruiting people who aren't necessarily that tech savvy because everyone knows how to use Facebook. So you're not gonna get people who are on these highly specialized sites to do the user testing. Um, it was pretty decent at allowing us to limit our 
demographic information. For instance, we really wanted to test only people in Texas and it allowed us to um, place ads only in that geographical area based on a certain level of income. Um, it was very help good at doing that. Um, so once we had the Facebook ad in place, that helped a lot with getting people to sign up. Um, and then once we screened them with screener questions, um, we got a pretty good list. Uh, another challenge that we faced that you discussed is getting our incentives right. Um, we found that even though we had a huge list of, of people re recruited, um, a lot of them weren't showing up for our, and we figured the reason is because the incentive we offered just wasn't enough to make, but they didn't consider it worth our time in the end. And so they would cancel last minute. And uh, our first incentive was about $10 for an hour. And that was just not enough for people. And so we raised it and it was a gift card. It was a grocery gift card they could use. So we raised it to $25 for an hour. And that increased the amount of people who actually showed up for the actual interview. Um, so it's really important to get that incentive right. Um, so yeah, I, I think that it that worked out for us really well. Um, the only thing about Facebook is that you know it is you can't really get the demographic information completely right, and you really have to make sure you're screening people at the back end. So we had a smart sheet that would we would have them fill out a form, and we would have that to a smart sheet where we could actually look at that and see who was actually eligible for the test. Wow, that's great. Thank you for mm -hmm. sharing, um, yeah. Carla. Want to add some? Um, yes, um, actually, we found that recruiting people was easier when um, we were doing virtual remote user testing. Um, in the past, when we had in-person user testing, um, we would offer an incentive of the gift cards, but uh, people found it hard uh, to park downtown Chicago. Uh, this was before the pandemic, of course. Um, and we found that uh, now when we have users uh, there uh, doing it remotely over Zoom or whatever, and um, they're more likely to respond, uh, especially for gift cards, because they don't have to worry about traveling. Um, so that's a plus, um, a big plus as far as remote uh, user testing. Um, we recruit people mainly from our website. Uh, we ask people to create an account, and when they create an account, uh, we ask them if they would like to be involved in user testing. Um, if they say yes, we do a report of everyone that said yes, and we have their names and their email addresses. Um, so that way we know that th these people are our target users. They, they've come to our website, as long as they aren't pro bono attorneys or, or uh, work for legal aid, uh, organizations, then we can use them um, uh, for testing. And um, another thing we do is when we send out the uh, initial email, we're very specific about what we want to test. Um, if there's something we're testing on our mobile website, we, um, you know, ask them, you know, to make sure that they have a working uh, phone, whether an iPhone or um, Samsung or whatever. Um, and we also make sure that uh, if we're testing on desktop, um, we make sure we know what browser people are using. Um, we found that we had uh, trouble with the differences of the way our website is uh, rendered on tablets. So that's something you always want to find out. Um, and put as much information as you can into the initial email, um, but uh, you don't want to bombard them, but make sure that they know um, that the testing will be done over Zoom and not go to meetings or send some other uh, video conferencing. Um, also make sure that you know what the time commitment is and that they know what it is and give a general overview of the testing procedure. And, um, we would like to give them deadlines um, as far as their responses um, and give clear dates as to when the testing is going to be. Once we, we um, had a link up for testing and um, some people went and tested but didn't let us know that they tested. Um, when we closed the link, we didn't get their uh, information in, but we still had to give them the card because 
you know, they, they did the testing for us. Um, I would also um, just reiterate that if you send out an email to 50 people, you still may only get 10 responses, if that. Um, your response rate is always going to be lower. Um, so just keep that in mind and don't let it discourage you. Um, another thing, um, like uh, uh, Lauren said, oh. like, uh, be intentional about the demographics when you're recruiting. And um, oh. a lot of people may be uh, internet savvy, but um, not everyone that uses our site is internet savvy or computer savvy. So we also want to make sure to include people that may um, not be as, uh, may not use the computer, you know, five hours a day or 10 hours a day as some of us. So that's about it. Awesome. That's super helpful, Carla. I think um, hearing about those different like devices and systems that you're finding during testing, that's really interesting. Thanks for sharing. Um, Kim. Um, I'm going to share some recruitment lessons we learned in, I think, our, the very first time we tried to do remote usability testing. Um, we were testing a texting program, testing a texting program um, that we were building to um, allow our website users to get follow-up information from our website. So say if someone visited our website about a divorce, we could send follow-ups to say, did you fill out the forms? Did you ever file them in court, et cetera. Um, and so one thing we did initially that I would encourage others to try, especially if you don't have a high traffic public facing website and you're thinking, how can I find people? Um, we initially just tested with our own family and friends that obviously has some limitations because when you're testing with people you know, they may be worried about hurting your feelings or saying bad things about something that you made. Although I will say that some of our family and friends really did not hold back and gave us um, really truthful feedback about um, feelings and, and, and thoughts they had on this program. Um, but it's better than, definitely better than doing nothing. And so everyone on our team recruited about five people and, and we were able to test on that group. Um, and a big pro of this is that you can bother them and kind of prod them along if they forget to answer your survey at the very end. So it's a very reliable way to get some feedback from people who haven't been looking at the product day after day after day and have a good outside view. Um, and at least one person on our team actually had a friend who had used Michigan Legal Help's resources in the past um, to file a case. And so if you can think of people you know um, who might be in that situation, those are great people to recruit. Um, later, we wanted to test our texting on actual website visitors. And so we put a banner at the top of the Michigan Legal Help website that said, you know, click here, help us test um, this new program we have. And there we learned some really good lessons about levels of drop off and how many levels of drop off when you have, have to have lots of touches with someone to complete the process. So um, about four, our process was that someone clicks the banner, they sign up using their email address, then we contact them with information about how to participate. Um, they have to sign up for this text flow. Then after the text flow is done, um, they had to complete, uh, I think we had a Google form to use um, to give us other feedback. And so just as an idea of how that filtered out, um, about 40 people initially signed up. We sent 15 of those people to another program doing usability testing. So basically we had 25 people. Out of those 25, 11 of them followed through to start the testing. Um, and we finally got feedback from about eight. Um, and we learned from people who work on stuff like this that that sounds about right. Um, so you have to kind of cast a wide net, recruit a lot of people and just get what you can get. Um, and we definitely learned that after each step that someone has to take after they click, um, there's a chance for them to forget about us, decide they don't have time. And so I'll talk later about how we improved this um, with our other methods of remote usability testing as we um, moved along. Awesome, thanks for sharing, Kim. Yeah, casting a wide net and it just, I just saw the, the chat about it just allow a lot of time because it takes, it takes time. 
So thank you for sharing. All right, so next we are going to talk um, pretty quickly on conducting a remote usability test. So we just spent all that time on how to prep, get all your materials, your guides, um, recruiting, and now we'll talk about actually conducting. So first, um, setting up. So I, I kind of touched on this just a moment ago, but there are you know even more splits in how you could do remote usability testing. One is moderated. Um, moderated is someone is present with the participant, you're observing, you're prompting questions. Um, this can be done over some conferencing tools, um, over the phone even. It's just really a mode to um, for a facilitator to be able to share the thing that needs to be reviewed and then also have that conversation. Unmoderated is a little bit trickier because um, you're, you as a moderator or someone won't actually be there with the participant. So it requires um, more thought to share the thing and instructions um, with your participant uh, so that you can capture their feedback. So we'll talk about that in just a moment. We will start with moderated. So this is maybe a little bit more familiar, easier translation from in-person to remote. Um, so in this scenario, you know, you have a moderator, they're using a testing guide to ask questions and observe the participants. They're talking out loud, sharing their thoughts. Um, you're, you're watching as a participant's walking through. Uh, a bonus in this is that because a moderator is present, the prototype can be a little bit less polished. So if something breaks or um, they hit a dead end or something, you sort of redirect, reorient them um, if the prototype is you know, not quite as um, built out. It is not limited to digital prototypes. Um, you could, it takes a little more time, but like mail a paper prototype to someone to receive and then do this um, more remotely. So uh, it's not, not just limited to digital prototypes, but in digital prototypes, you can actually um, obviously share this in a much easier way. You can screen share. Uh, one thing I like to do often is screen share from Zoom and Zoom has a feature where you can actually hand over remote control. So if you um, share your screen and you have something that you want them to interact with, you can share remote control, but you could just email a link over to them. Um, there, there are lots of ways to share and really just requires a way for you to share and have the conversation. Um, included here is, especially since you are moderating the session, um, you want to sort of uh, in the introduction, set up the scene and, and the stage of what you're wanting from them and, and having them think aloud is often something that you're interested in hearing. Um, this is some sample language to get participants to be comfortable with you. Uh, thinking out loud, while it seems normal, when you're actually interacting with something can be a little bit unnatural and uncomfortable. So just having them, um, just letting them know that we want you to think out loud, tell us what you're looking at, what you think about what you're looking at, um, that can be helpful to sort of uh, remind them and prompt them as they're going through a more moderated session. Um, in a moderated session, a huge benefit is that you can actually invite other team members. And we really recommend considering having a dedicated note taker. So just have a partner to join, listen in, take notes for you, or even recording your sessions if you can do that. Um, having a standard format for capturing notes is helpful because you'll have multiple sessions and at, by the end of it, you want to you know, be able to take a look and analyze that. So having a standard um, way that you've captured notes can be helpful. Moving over to unmoderated. Again, this is a little bit more tricky, requires a little bit more planning, but can be just as effective um, as doing moderated. So in this uh, approach, participants will interact with your prototype on their own. Um, and responses need to be captured in some way. So uh, the screenshot that I have on the right there is a um, user research tool. It's called User Zoom, it's their Go platform. Um, some of these research tools have built in unmoderated uh, capabilities. So if, if the screenshot's tiny, but it'll actually like task out things for um, participants to do and they can start and stop. So that's a way to capture like task time. Um, it's a recording software, so you can, they'll like the participant can verbalize as they're walking through um, interacting, and it'll actually capture it. Uh, a note on the prototype: since you won't be there, it's important to have um, a way for participants to recover from mistakes or dead ends in your prototype. So um, maybe making sure that everything's connected, or they you know know where to go if they ever get lost in your prototype. Um, and I think I mentioned this before, but it could eliminate any nerves 
with a facilitator present, this does allow a lot more flexibility and autonomy for the participant. They can do it um, when they have time on their own. Um, and you know, someone's not there sort of probing them along. Obviously the drawback to that is you're not there to probe them. <laughs> if you have any questions um, as they're giving feedback that you wanna um, dive into, but uh, kind of one of the pros and cons of unmoderated. And again, you will need a way to share and collect feedback. Um, I'm mentioning these more high-tech um, user research tools, but you could even just have some really detailed instructions on having them record themselves. So if you send them you know, a prototype and just ask them to find a way to do a video recording of themselves doing um, your usability test, that's another way of capturing that feedback. So this is just, um, I won't talk too much on this, but a chart of some industry tools that facilitate unmoderated testing. I mentioned um, user Zoom, so it's in there, uh, but there are um, quite a few, so we'll link those into our resources, but wanted to show that there are um, lots of capabilities to do unmoderated usability testing. So check those out to make sure, um, to see if they meet your needs. One bonus of um, using a tool to facilitate unmoderated usability testing is that there is um, some built-in tools for analysis. Uh, so some of these platforms I mentioned, like the user Zoom Go platform can aggregate task time. If you had a bunch of users it can or participants, it can show you like how many succeeded and failed at each task. It might have transcription for you. Um, so lots of cool features in those tools. Obviously, you know, you get what you pay for. Um, but even if you're just having someone record um, themselves in Zoom or in some other tool, getting transcription can be really helpful um, because you're, you know, you're able to actually see. So the screenshot I have is, um, I wanna say it's a plugin for Zoom that actually does transcription. And the, the last note is that built-in tools for analysis are great, but uh, it does not replace your own synthesis. And Ashley will talk about that in just a moment. Couple um, considerations uh, before we move on, just for remote, generally usability testing, moderated or unmoderated, is that again, there's just more considerations. So one is especially on the tech. So as much as you can prepare, um, pilot with your teammates, uh, make sure that it works. Uh, all the tech, I mean, prepare ahead of time um, and then share really specific instructions with your participant, especially if they get stuck, um, how they can contact you. And then the second is um, the prototype, make sure it works. <laughs> and again, there are different considerations for moderated versus unmoderated, um, but just making sure you're thinking through how you're going to share. And then also um, having backups, because if you have a live link, who knows when, you know, the day that they're testing, maybe that link goes down. So you have to figure out some backup methods, making sure that all of that is prepared ahead of time um, before your test. And then the last consideration is, especially in the unmoderated um, world, you might end up sharing links. Um, and that's great because the participant can open it on their own computer and walk through it. But if there are things that you don't want to be shared, you can't guarantee that it won't be shared. So thinking about confidentiality and what you're willing to have out in the world and what you don't. Um, okay, so love to hear from the community panel again. Um, Carla, how about you kick us off? Um, I'd just like to uh, reiterate that it's really great to record the sessions um, while you're doing it or to have another person uh, taking notes. Um, that way you can really focus on what the user is doing. If they're at a certain place in the testing and they make, you know, a face or, you know, or you know, like a grimace or something, you can always say, uh, you know, ask me ask them what are they thinking about now or or how are they feeling about what they're doing or um you know you can find out why they're making that face and that's something you might miss if you're um, not really paying attention um another thing is um uh, you can always share your screen or have them share their screens so um but just really Recording it is and has really helped us out a lot. So uh, we do that. Awesome, good advice. Um, Lauren, how about you? So we used Zoom and we had them share their screen, which was always a struggle uh, because a lot of people know how to use Zoom and 
but like maybe one tenth of people know how to share their screen on Zoom. Uh, so make sure they know how to do that before you start the test. Uh, but we would have to share their screen and we would always ask them permission to record that and then we would record record it. Um, I, I also think that it's very important to have another person on the test. I would always have a silent partner who was taking notes um, because you really are extremely focused on making sure that going the path you would expect them to go. And um, if they're not figuring out why, um, it is it is extremely important to listen to verbal cues, to see facial expressions, if they're willing to share their video with you. Sometimes it's not feasible because, you know, it's hard to look at a share screen and a video at the same time. Um, you know, ask if you, if you notice any confusion, make sure you give them a couple seconds to figure it out, which is really hard when you want to ask a question, but make sure you give them a couple seconds and then be like, are you, is there something confusing here? Um, you know, ask questions. Uh, it's very important to follow up on that kind of stuff. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's kind of a mix because you really want to have your set questions that you always ask everybody, but you really want to also be flexible enough to ask open-ended questions for people. Like if you're noticing something that's different, bothering them. Uh, yeah. And every test is different. Sometimes, uh, you'll notice people, people will sometimes give you conflicting advice. You're going to have to figure it out. Like uh, sometimes people will be like, well, I feel like that would be better if this was over here. And another person will like the next test, you'll have moved it. And they'll be like, well, I think that would be really better over here. And so it's, that's why it's important to get, don't base your um, feedback on one test. You really have to get multiple people because of that. Um, Cause sometimes something's really not an issue. It's an issue with one person and uh, it's important to pick up patterns. Um, so, yeah. Thank you, Lauren. Um, yeah, so building on that, I think a lot of things that, that Lauren um, and Carla just shared um, really take us into the last part here, which is you know, now that you've conducted this usability testing and you've gathered all of this great research, how do you, you know, synthesize and incorporate these insights to make improvements um, in, in, your, in the thing, <laughs> in your resource? Um, and so synthesis is, is critically important because it's pulling directly from the user research again in that spirit of letting the learnings really guide the design decisions and, and the improvements and not just you know, sort of basing that off of our own problem solving and intuition. We're really letting the research be the driver um, of defining what the pain points are and, and revealing opportunities for improvement. Um, and so as part of synthesis, you, know, you wanna go back through your notes and analyze the, you know, the, the notes that you've taken for each participant, or if you have those, you know, Zoom recordings, mm -hmm. um, it's really great to go through again. Um, you know, start to identify, you know, things that can, um, things that can pull out patterns and themes. And that's why it's really helpful to have that, you know, set, that script of, of questions. So, you know, you're gathering the same information, but like Lauren mentioned, right, you may have probes that are sort of nuanced for, for each participant. Um, as, you know, Victoria shared in the script, you might have some of those quantitative insights right around, um, you know, how did people feel about a, a certain thing that they interacted with. So any of that information that you gathered, um, this is really the opportunity to, to dive in, find those patterns and themes, um, especially with an eye towards, you know, highlighting those pain points or those moments of frustration or confusion, right? Um, and really letting the data reveal was this a one-time thing or was this something consistently that we saw you know, across multiple users and, and let that really guide and shape how you prioritize um, and define recommendations and opportunities to improve your solution. Um, so you know, again, going through the notes grid, um, make sure you're pulling from the raw data. You can pull out quotes, you can pull out insights, um, you know, the, that um, uh, the sort of, um, excuse me, my, Brain is failing me. Um, the quantitative information again. Um, and it's really important um, to make sure that your synthesis is unbiased and um, really helpful if you did have someone who was helping you take notes, it's something that you can talk through together um, and really think out and parse um, together um, while you're doing that sort of synthesis. Um, I won't play this video, but when we share the slides, there's a great video here that highlights um, a really great um, technique called affinity mapping or insights mapping. Um, that actually allows you to tease out those insights and through the act of pulling out insights, define those patterns and themes. And this is really important because this you know, helps to create 
um, and define those recurring pain points, the recurring challenges, the things that are sort of consistent across your, your body of, uh, of research um, and synthesize those into those high level findings. Um, affinity mapping is really important because it allows the research to reveal those patterns and insights as opposed to going in with predetermined challenges and fitting insights into things um, right, that we might have assumptions about. So it's really letting the research um, reveal that. And once we have identified those, those challenges, those pain points, um, those places and spaces that you know, we know um, can be improved, that's where we can go back to the design um, and bring those insights to think about new solutions, to think about, you know, how can we communicate this better? How can we organize this information um, you know, more intuitively based on the insights that have been provided? Um, iteration is a really key part of this process. Um, we might also you know, identify that there's more we want to learn. And if you recall the, you know, the double diamond, right, that's OK to iterate. It might expose an area that we want to do additional research for. It, might reveal opportunities or challenges that weren't on your radar before. that are actually, you know, something that that you want to continue to explore. And so, um, here is really where you know your designs are updated to incorporate that feedback, and you can you can return to that um, moment to pause and reflect and and consider, um, you know, if if that testing has um, really revealed um, these positive improvements for your resource. Um, I know that we are coming up on time. So I'm going to lightning round through a bunch of resources um, that are really here. Um, just, you know, we at the very beginning sort of acknowledged that there are a lot of different types of research. And so wanted to just highlight a few additional considerations now that, you know, you've heard about usability testing, um, you know, maybe usability testing um, isn't the only thing that you want to try. And so just to highlight, um, some different tools and resources that also um, can support you in, um, you know, learning more about your users. Um, so the first is a resource called Optimal Workshop that is good for um, card sorting and tree testing. So this is, you know, trying to understand your users' expectations um, or understanding of a topic or perhaps you know, where they might think to go and find something. So it's really good at diving, uh, diving into um, the navigation of a site by doing, you know, a card sort or a tree testing, where might a user intuitively think to go and find a certain piece of information. Um, and we will hear from Kim one more time um, on uh, how, how uh, her and her team have leveraged um, tools like this. Um, another resource is called Hotjar, and Hotjar is something that can be incorporated into existing websites. And it has two primary functionalities. Um, one is that it creates a heat map of where users are clicking and interacting with your website. So that can be really valuable information to just understand the behaviors um, of where users are you know, exploring and finding information on your site. Um, it also has some built-in surveying tools, some light surveying tools. So you can get you know, quantitative input um, and data on um, you know, what users are doing and, and get their opinions there as well. Um, we love to highlight you know, some of these surveying tools. Um, Maze is a really great one um, that actually incorporates both uh, prototype usability testing and surveying in one. Um, Typeform and Google Form or other um, tools like this are also really great for um, prototyping, you know, if you're designing a form or a flow, right, mocking up what that flow of information might be. Um, so to sort of simulate, um, you know, a user who might be encountering, you know, a specific um, flow of information on your site, you can mock that up um, leveraging these tools. First, um, it's also a really great way to capture both qualitative and quantitative insights in one. Um, so definitely think about leveraging um, these tools. Um, Unbounce is a non-development, or it's a development-free resource for creating landing pages. Um, primarily, it's used for a marketing context, but it can be really great for a few things as well. Um, one is exploring content. Um, so it's, it allows you to very easily set up um, A-B testing. So if you have two, you know, two versions of a, of a page that you're exploring, you can easily set up those two versions and kind of see, you know, how users are responding um, to, those different, uh, to those different versions. 
Um, it's also a really great way to measure performance. Um, and potentially if, you know, we've heard a, a few groups um, recruit through their website um, to stand up a, a simple page that allows you to, you know, recruit users through a site, um, something that you can easily add to um, and connect to any website. Um, Google Analytics um, and, you know, Data Studio. So, you know, if you do have an existing online resource, um, hopefully you have, um, you know, the ability to um, have some sort of analytics um, from that site. And it's always good to check in to just see, you know, what you can learn about user engagement and how your users are, you know, interacting with your site, whether that's, you know, seeing where they navigate to, how they come to the site, right? If they're coming from a Google search or a referral or other, um, maybe the time that they're spending on different pages or the site as a whole that can, you know, give some insight um, into the usability. Um, and then finally, we always like to make this plug for um, customer service data. If you have, you know, a, a help desk or a customer service team or chat bots, um, leveraging, um, leveraging user insights that come in through that way. Are there pain points? Are there challenges? Are there things that um, users are reaching out for through those platforms that can also help to you know, identify areas for further research? Um, Kim, I'm gonna hand it over to you to do um, a quick overview of um, some of the card sorting that you've done and, um, and then we'll wrap up for the day. Sure. Um... So I think um, Ashley mentioned earlier that we jumped in and started using Optimal Workshop to host um, our most recent round of usability tests. Um, and so we used unmoderated usability testing. So I wasn't on Zoom with someone. We just created the tests and put links on the internet, and then people could do them um, when they wanted. Um, and so we looked at a few other tools, but uh, so there's other tools that do similar things. Um, we broke up our usability testing into multiple shorter tests, and um, I mentioned earlier that we had a problem with drop-off um, when recruiting people to do this texting program. Um, so here, what we did is we had a landing page on our website that listed our usability testing options. So there's a banner on our um, homepage that says, click here to help us improve our website. Um, they then go to a landing page that explains, here's what we're doing, here's the incentives. We did a gift card drawing for um, participants. And then there was a section that had available tests. They clicked the link, they went right to the test and they could do it. So um, we had a pretty easy time recruiting people there because I think number one, they were five or 10 minute tasks. So they were easy to do. And the moment someone decided they wanted to participate, it was like, great, click the link and do it. They didn't have to wait for us to respond and then guide them through the rest of the process. Um, so we had, I looked up our numbers right before this. We had our landing page up for about one month um, and we were able to get 171 completed tests in that time. Um, and that was over six tasks. And some of those were linked. Um, so benefits of doing the testing this way were um, less drop off, easier to recruit. Um, we also, one of our tools was, a, one of our tests was a card sort. And in the past when we've done that in person, um, the card sort can be hard to um, present data. on. So if you've never done it, you give people a list of categories and a list of cards and say what fits where and they put the cards. Then what do you do with that information? How do you synthesize it? So. Um, Optimal Workshop has this built-in, um, automatically made uh, matrix that shows how often different cards appear in various categories, and it's just there for you to use. Um, related to the landing page, um, that's something that was really helpful because it did take some time up front for our developer to create this landing page, but now it exists and it's out there. Um, the link is not front and center on our webpage anymore, but from now on, when we wanna do some usability testing, we can just throw the links on there, turn the banner back on, um, and it's good to go. Um, other tools for this, if, if people um, don't have you know, an in-house developer to build a landing page like this, you can use something like Wix or Squarespace um, and make a link for a usability testing landing page. Um, yes, and do you have a ready link to that 
landing page that you can pop in. It's not live on our homepage anymore, so I can't drop the link, but the link exists. It's just not advertised on our homepage. Um, and so the, yeah, you can use Wix or Squarespace. Um, that's a great tip from um, Adam Skosky from Briefly Studios, if anyone here knows him. Um, we used a raffle payment structure for the shorter test. So we did one drawing for 10 users and we offered a $20 gift card. And that seemed to be um, a good incentive for people to join in. Um, I will mention it is, as Victoria mentioned, a bit annoying to coordinate like the drawings and then the person doesn't respond. So we were really clear on our landing page. Here's what you need to do to be considered. If we don't hear from you within this time, we'll move to the next person to be really clear about expectations. Um, and Optimal Workshop also has built in, uh, you can buy testers from Optimal Workshop. Um, so for some tests in the future where we're not specifically looking for our own website users, we definitely might consider that option just to get rid of the headache of needing to do these drawings and send out the gift cards and um, all of that. Awesome, thank you, Kim. Thank you, Kim. Um, I know we are very short on time. We wanna leave at least a few minutes for um, Q&A. So I'm not actually gonna go through resources. The one I wanna point out too is on this slide. As part of the same TIG that Angela mentioned, um, we also created a more deep dive into the whole design process um, in the legal for legal design. And yes, beautiful, thank you. <laughs> so that is linked there. It also has a bunch of links to templates that might help get you started. Um, so those are linked in there as well as this presentation. Um, and then the other resources in the deck are um, all the things that we've covered, just links to them in one place. So feel free to check those out on remote usability testing, unmoderated, and then other uh, remote user research tools. So that's all that we have. I'm going to pass it back to Angela to facilitate just a few minutes of Q&A, but thank you all for joining us today. All right. Well, thank you all. It's always wonderful to hear um, from you, Ashley and Victoria, and I loved um, all the questions. So go ahead, Carolyn. Yeah. Thanks. I, my son, I've got to call my son back in five minutes. So I'm, <laughs> that's why I raised my question really quickly. So. Um, one of the things I've been working on, my, you know, my own little private self, is there's a uh, there's a, a a a screening tool called Realm R E A L M, which is the rapid estimate of adult literacy in medicine, and I've been trying to develop my own real rapid estimate of adult literacy in the law because I think it would be really useful when we're screening, when we're recruiting people, but we, if we can screen people at the fourth to sixth grade reading level, and it's a tool, there's about 60 words, they're all great, they all are at different grade levels. And um, I'm just, I, I can share it with people or I put it on LSN tap or something, if people be willing to help me um, both put in legal terms so that we can help people. So essentially, can you, it's really, can you read this word out loud? Um, and if you can read it out loud, then you may fall into one of these different um, grade level reading groups. And then it helps you very quickly screen out, screen who you want to be testing your users. And I would rather use legal words rather than medical words. I still need some sort of reading specialist to help us um, put together the score, create the score at the end. But that, this is like my pitch. If people would be willing to help with this, I would, I would, I'm, I've been pitching it everywhere I can find, <laughs> except I forgot to do it at LSC, the ITC conference. But I just wanted to do that, see if people are interested in that. Thanks, Carolyn. You could uh, definitely follow up with Ladirdra. Um, maybe put something on the LSN tab listserv too. Other yeah, questions? I I think Carolyn um, also highlights like, you know, another factor for, you know, uh, screening when you are, um, you know, trying to recruit, recruit a certain type of user. So that could be another, um, you know, something that, that you're trying to screen for. So I appreciate you um, flagging that. That's a very cool idea and project, Carolyn. Thank you for doing it and for bringing it to everyone's attention. 
Are there other questions in our last minute, our last few minutes? I'm sure people would stick around for another extra minute if you had questions. Um, if you don't have questions and you're getting ready to leave, you'll get a survey as soon as this is over. Please take a few minutes um, to do our survey. If you've ever had a TIG, you know that feedback and evaluation is very important. So please help us out. Um, and even if you don't know or care about TIGs, please take our survey anyway. Um, we really appreciate uh, everyone um, coming. Uh, sadly, we could not do our Testapalooza in person, um, but this was uh, a great resource instead. Um, so if there are no other questions, uh, we will sign off. You can always uh, reach out to Ladirdra um, with questions about usability testing, or I'm sure any of our panelists uh, would be happy to talk to you more um, about their experiences and um, what, what they have learned. So I think with that, we will sign off.